So I'm Lorraine Hartman and I wanted to give you a very warm welcome and a thank you for coming. I am the chair of the Our Lady of the Lake Justice and Peace Committee and I'm here to introduce Father John on behalf of all the event sponsors. Church Council of Greater Seattle, Fellowship of Reconciliation Seattle Chapter, Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action, Our Lady of the Lake Justice and Peace Committee, University Temple United Methodist Church, and the Wedgwood Justice and Peace Coalition. Peace seekers and peacemakers all, we're honored by the presence of Father John, internationally known prophetic voice for peace and nonviolence, nominated by Archbishop Desmond Tutu for the Nobel Peace Prize. John is author, editor of 30 books, including his autobiography, A Persistent Peace, and his most recent, and a focus of tonight's talk, The Nonviolent Life. And it's so nice to see so many friends and to hear about all the great things you're doing with Oh, Pax Christi and Ground Zero and FOR and all these various troublemaking groups. Um, and I'm just very, very heartened and just want to say thank you. I'm just back from South Africa in the middle of all that, the troubles I've got going on in my life. And, uh, you know, it's a lifelong dream to go there. Many of you probably worked to oppose apartheid. And I don't know that I maybe like you could have gotten in earlier. I went with my friend Father Ray and we went everywhere and met everybody. Johannesburg and Soweto and went to the churches that had been the sister parishes that I worked at from Washington DC, inner city DC in the 1980s. And uh, to go to those places and meet people and visit Winnie Mandela whom I had corresponded with in the 80s and she remembered me and it was just thrilling. And then we went to Peter Maritzburg. Now, how many of you know you're a Gandhi? You remember the beginning of the Gandhi movie? He gets thrown off the train because he's sitting in the first class and it's midnight and he's dropped in the middle of nowhere in South Africa. He's only been there for a week and he's a dopey 21 year old kid. And he's left in the waiting room of the Peter Maritzburg train station in 1893. And he's really scary and it's cold, and he sits on the floor till 9 a.m., and he knows this is it. What am I gonna do to, about this injustice? And he stands up, and he wrote in his autobiography, my act of nonviolence began that day. We went to the train station. I know it's a little over the top, but it's the same train station since 1893, the goofy old orange brick Victorian building the same tiled roof, the same waiting room. And we prayed there. It was so powerful that we could have a portion of Gandhi's spirit, all of us, to stand up and give our lives fighting injustice like he did. Then we went to Durban to go to the ashram that Gandhi built, which is still there. And he lived there for 20 years where he began the movement. And then we went down to Port Elizabeth to visit the home of Steve Biko, who was a personal real hero for me. And I think at the heart of South Africa, in many ways more than Mandela, for what he did, his vision of black consciousness, of being a human being, went to the house where he was banned and then prayed at his grave. And we made our way to Cape Town to Robben Island and spent a day there praying in Mandela's cell. And then I spent a day with Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And you know, uh, there's a lot of archbishops who don't like me. I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay. I, there's a lot of archbishops who don't welcome me. He catered a meal for me and brought all his friends in. It was, I felt like the prodigal son. We had a Eucharist together. And he says to me, <clears throat> which I say to you, we can never give up working for justice and peace, John, he said, looking at me. Never. We have to work at this till the day we die because our sisters and brothers are dying around the world. That's a solemn 
message I share with you. He's 82. He's been under death threat practically every day since he was 13. I don't know well, how well you know his story. And he was, he's been ill. And he was leaving for Iran the next day, which is no joke. He's causing so much trouble in South Africa at the moment, speaking out against the corruption in the ANC and so forth. So powerful. And if you, you some of you know me, in, you know, that's why he's on to me long ago. I'm going, oh, come on, Archbishop. Give me a break. How do you do it? Oh, so. And he looks me in the eye and he goes, I weep. I cry. I cry every single day about what's happening to our sisters and brothers. And I laugh. I laugh every single day. And I read the prophet Jeremiah and he weeps and he laughs and he goes and confronts the empire. And that's what I wanna do. I'm sharing that teaching with you. Isn't that great? He's not a raging, angry man, nor is he afraid, nor is he despairing, nor is he depressed. He's grieving and he's joyful and he's going forward. Are there any questions? <laughs> no, it's a, such a helpful thing. Friends, we are not powerless. We have a power to change ourselves and Seattle and our country and the world if we dare live up to it. The way of God, which is the methodology of nonviolence, which Gandhi and Dr. King have proved, and all our, we're working on too with Archbishop Tutu and so many others. I encourage you, don't give up. Don't be depressed and don't despair. Don't be afraid and don't sit back and do nothing just because things are so hard. We've got a way forward and we've got to try. And that's what I'd like to reflect with you a little bit. Maybe share a story or two and a little bit about violence and nonviolence. And you know, I've been talking about my new book, The Nonviolent Life. I'm still, <laughs> I know I'm stuck on a, a message, but I think Gandhi and King are right. That nonviolence is the only hope for the world. And I've been trying with you to reflect on what that means. So I want to share what I've Maybe say a word about Jesus, and then we have time for question and answers, Rich, and then we will resolve everything. <laughs> How does that sound as a plan? Yeah, yeah. Well, so if, for those of you who don't know me, or maybe you do, I don't know, but I'm 54, and was uh, really my change happened when I was uh, 21 and decided to go on a hitchhiking pilgrimage through Israel and I left the week Israel invaded Lebanon and all the Holy Land tours were canceled. The Summer War of 1982, you maybe remember that, Rich. It was called Operation Peace for Galilee. It was orchestrated at the Pentagon. We killed 60,000 people. And I hitchhiked through Israel, completely oblivious to everything, and spent a week camping out illegally at the Sea of Galilee, which was so beautiful and so exciting. There was nobody there, 1982. And... Uh, I was really reading the Sermon on the Mount for the first time and visiting the chapel of the Beatitudes. And it still shakes me. You know, I walked into that church, maybe you've been there, on the North Shore, that little hill, that little church. And I always say it was like graffiti as far as I was concerned. Written on the walls of the church. Can you imagine they did this? Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Doesn't sound good. Blessed are the meek, the gentle, the nonviolent. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. <laughs> Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those persecuted for working for justice. And the altar, love your enemies. And not being very bright, I thought to myself, oh my God, I think this guy's serious. <laughs> and it was, you know, standing on the balcony, grappling with these texts, that I saw these jets swoop down from the sky, breaking the sound barrier, setting off all these sonic booms, flying over me in the Chapel of the Beatitudes and dropping bombs. And it changed my life. I got to see war at the Sea of Galilee, at the place where Jesus did, blessed are the peacemaker and love your enemies. And like you, I decided, right, I'm gonna try to get with the program. And I don't know how to do it, but with you, I'm on the journey. 
And that's what I find helpful, that living the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount and the way of nonviolence and peace, love, and compassion is a journey, and we're on it together toward a whole new world of peace. Where are you on the road to peace? When did your journey start? How have you been a victim of the culture of war through your life in a crazy country? And how have you turned and tried to become a person of nonviolence and peace? And as you look at the rest of your life, as I'm reflecting, I invite you to reflect on your own journey. With the short time we have left on Earth, how can we go deeper into the life of nonviolence, the journey of peace? These are great questions. Uh, that led me, you know, to sit at the feet of Daniel and Philip Berrigan, my friends and teachers. And it, it's just like a matter of days, I always say. If you're going to be with the Berrigans before you have to go and get arrested. And <laughs> Phil was like, go get arrested at the Pentagon, kid, and report back to me. <laughs> it was the way it was. And Dan, I, I was asking Dan the meaning of life. I was so nervous, 1982. Dan, Dan. What's the point of all this again? That's what I blurted out. And he said, oh, so helpful. All you have to do is make your story fit into the story of Jesus. And at first I thought, oh, that's so wonderful. I thought, oh my God. You know, he could have said, go and end all wars and nuclear weapons. This is so much better, but maybe even harder and so much more liberating. I invite you to reflect on that. That led me to El Salvador to work with the Jesuits at the university who sent me out to a refugee camp where the U.S. was bombing the area and to greet the death squads when they came in and to have known these great Jesuits, six of them who were later assassinated, changed my life. And that led me to walk onto the Seymour Johnson Air Force Base with Philip Berrigan in 1993. You know, by now you've heard I have a long, <clears throat> let's just say I have a problem with recidivism. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and like Bill and Steve Kelly and so many good friends here in Seattle, we walked right up to one of the F-15 nuclear fighter bombers, took out a hammer, and I went up to the side of it and hammered once on it like that. Didn't even chip the paint, but... As I said to the judge later, um, Your Honor, I'm just doing what it says in the Bible. Someday you know the Holy Prophet, Your Honor. Someday, you know, he said, someday these people are going to come along and they're going to beat their swords into plowshares and study war no more. And Jesus gave us that famous commandment, Your Honor. Love your enemies, don't nuke them. That's the actual translation from the original Greek. Yeah, that didn't go over well with the judge either. I don't know. I'm trying to be humorous about all of this because it's the only way to keep yourself going. What an experience, friends. Really powerful. And uh, we were thrown on the ground. I had 25 soldiers with machine guns at our heads. We joined hands. There were four of us. We prayed. And then there were 50 soldiers. And then there were 100 soldiers. And there were 200 soldiers. And then there were 500 soldiers. And then there were 1,000 soldiers. And we had walked into and shut down the whole annual U.S. national war games. 10,000 soldiers. And the top 10 generals were all fired. How did these people get right into the center of it? Ours was the 50th of about 90 plowshares actions now. And we were put in jail for Phil and I for about nine months and Bruce and Lynn, little cell, we never left it. Never, never went outdoors, never exercised, nothing. Uh, it was horrible, really, really, really terrible. And, uh, but we took, the gospel and started the reading the gospel of Mark. And then, one, you know, we took a little piece of Wonder Bread, which we were served for breakfast. And on Mondays, we had those little plastic cups with the grape juice, which I always joke, we found if you hit it in the top of the toilet, it ferments quite nicely. <laughs> and it was like Jesus was right there with us. I'm just sharing with you my journey. It was so powerful. And I always think there's an inverse proportionality. The more that I try to do, I'm going to change the world and end war, and I'm doing it, the less happens. The more you let go, and your life is over, 
and you've been destroyed, crushed by the culture, and you walk forward into the darkness. Now God can do something. The more happens. Daniel Berrigan always taught me, you only get enough light for the next step. That means one step. Not the day, not the next week, not the next year. But the trick is to keep taking next steps in the dark, in faith. Oh, there's so many stories to share. My trip to Iraq, my work at September 11th at Ground Zero. I was the coordinator for the Red Cross on the chaplains, working with the relatives who lost loved ones. And our, our demonstrations against the war in Afghanistan. And getting kicked out of New York and moving to New Mexico, the poorest state in the country, number one in everything, including military spending, number one in nuclear weapons. I was telling Mike from the radio show today, we think there's 2,500 nuclear weapons at the Albuquerque airport. Um, and it's number one in drunk driving, child hunger, suicide, domestic violence, alcoholism. The section in northern New Mexico, hands down the worst place in the United States, more murders than anywhere else, the center of all drugs, and right at the mountain, is Los Alamos, birthplace of the bomb, where business is booming, where Obama is still trying to build this state-of-the-art plutonium bomb factory. He's done more for nuclear weapons than anybody since Reagan in 1983. We have our annual peace vigil there, and we put on sackcloth and sit in ashes and take over the whole town of Los Alamos every year in Hiroshima Day, taking up the story of Jin Jonah in the town of Nineveh from the Bible to repent of the mortal sin of war and nuclear weapons and beg the God of peace for the gift of nuclear disarmament, to try to take our work for peace public without judging and condemning, pointing fingers, because we, we're all in the same boat together, and say, we, we, we're, this is not working. We need, and we're, we're so poor and bankrupting and poisoning ourselves, and they're not making us safe. And so we're in the throes of that now. That hasn't gone over very well but you do what you can. Um, and, you know, so I come from that. You know, where I, I stay in New Mexico, I look out at Los Alamos. And we have, you know, our other friends here tonight can tell you much more detail. Some fifteen to 20,000 nuclear weapons still on the planet. But there's 25 wars happening with the U.S. selling weapons to both sides. But there's four billion people in a subhuman extreme poverty. The UN says a billion people are starving to death. But we're in the throes of catastrophic climate change, our destruction of the earth. And we were talking this afternoon that the latest reports saying within 20, 30 years, we will force 40% of all creatures into extinction. Last week, the congressional record reported that over the next 30 years, the United States government has now committed in its budget to spend $1 trillion to upgrade its nuclear weapons and Trident submarines and weapons of mass destruction. This is insanity besides being unacceptable. It's a world of total violence. It's like we're living in some kind of zombie movie or whether we're addicted to violence, but that's, that imagery and that language doesn't even work because it's structured and systemic, and institutionalized, and it's holy, it's spiritual, it's the will of God, it's perfectly normal, it's totally legitimate, and it's meticulously legal. The first letter Daniel, uh, Thomas Merton wrote to Daniel Berry in 1960, look it up, it's incredible. He says, well, when they finally succeed at killing us and blowing up the planet, it'll be totally legal. You and I can't stand for this anymore. And we have to stand up publicly. How? Gandhi and King use this clumsy word nonviolence, and I want to reflect with you about it. And just, I keep inviting us to, to ponder what does it mean? How do you define it? How are you doing on that journey of nonviolence in your life? I always say it begins with the vision of the heart, and that this is the key to the whole spiritual life, or just life, or all organized religion, or theology, or any spirituality that we're all one, we're all reconciled. Every human being on the planet is your very sister and brother. The gift of peace was given millennia ago. And if you can enter into the spiritual truth of reality of our common unity, my sister, my brother, with every human being, you can never hurt anyone again, or much less kill someone, 
or be silent and just go about your day to day when there's 25 wars, 15,000 nuclear weapons, a billion people starving, catastrophic climate change, and the whole litany of violence that you're all resisting. <sighs> the prisoners here in town to torture, racism, sexism, violence against children. So there's nothing passive about this. This is active love, pursuing the truth of our common unity, reconciling every human being, allowing the God of peace to disarm our hearts of the violence within us, that we can be instruments of God's disarming love. Standing up publicly, like all our heroes, from now on, and saying no, and resisting these structures and institutions of mass murder. Practicing, this is so wonderful. Unconditional non-retaliatory, all-inclusive, all-encompassing, sacrificial, universal love. We get to love everybody with one catch. There is no cause, however noble, for which you and I will ever again support the taking of a single human life. No, no, we just got to kill Hitler or Saddam or Osama. No. That's the boundary line of nonviolence. Nonviolence sets boundaries in this culture of violence that we can then begin to discover what it means to be a human being, that we can discover what it means to love and practice universal love and boundless compassion and the peace of God. But it's in this addiction where you have to say no, and we have to do it as a people. So Gandhi says we're just beginning to figure it out. Well, I've been trying forever, and that's why I wrote this book with my friends at Pache Beni, Help Me. And here's my take. This is the thesis of the book, The Nonviolent Life, and see what you think about this. I'm not sure you're going to agree with it, but just ponder this one. Nonviolence means three simultaneous attributes in our lives. At the same time, first, real nonviolence to yourself really going to make peace with yourself. Cultivate interior nonviolence. Second, at the same time, we're going to practice meticulous interpersonal nonviolence to every human being on the planet and all creatures and all of creation. Third, at the same time, you have to have one foot in the global grassroots movement of nonviolence. Well, I can see that didn't go over too well. See, my thought is that we're good at one of those, or maybe two of those, but we don't want to do all three. But Gandhi and Dorothy Day and Dr. King were trying to do all three, and that's what Christ calls us to do in all the world's religions. Like, there's a lot of us, or some of us, a lot of church people who are really nice. <laughs> a nice is not a strong point for me. 32 years of Jesuit education, I better not go there. You know really peaceful to yourselves and your relatives and not at all involved in the struggle. That's not the Christian way. It's not nonviolence. On the other hand, there's a lot of us who are really active, really engaged, really working for justice and peace. And we're mad and mean for peace. And it's not work. You know, we're full of Junk and violence, and our relationships are not so good. So let me just say a word about that for a moment. To invite you to reflect, again, where are you on the life of nonviolence? And with your time left, how can you go deeper? Why not? You know, it's not worth for me listening to the media, people, the politicians. Let's take our saints and heroes seriously and go forward. I got this such a sad letter on Friday from this guy in maximum security prison in Northern California. And he's been reading this book and he's going, how do I be nonviolent to myself? And then he just starts writing about it. I was beat up as a kid. So I beat up all of everybody else. And then I beat up everybody in the school. And then I joined a gang. And then we went up and beat up everybody and we started killing people. Now I'm in life in prison. And now I'm beating everybody up in here. And he goes, you know, now that I think about it, it hasn't worked. No, it's so touchy. It hasn't made me happy. You know, no one has taught him. I mean, we're all victims of wounded people of violence from this culture. And do you want to go forth and be wounded wounders? Or like Henry Nouwen said, be wounded healers. So I like what Thich Nhat Hanh says. Just look. 
deeply within. What's going on inside of you? When you feel that violence, the roots of violence inside you, ponder it. And don't beat yourself up on it. The point is to stop the cycle of violence, which is in each one of us. And to begin to cultivate interior nonviolence. I don't even know if this makes sense. But if you see what I mean, to try to create a space of peace. Actually, what we're talking about are becoming mystics. Only a new kind of dangerous mysticism where your very presence is a threat to empire. To, dare I say, banger. You don't even have to say anything. You walk in the room and, and, and well, you get the idea. So how can you let go of your wounds or, or, or heal your wounds or let go of your hurts and bitterness and resentments and anger and violence in your prayer and meditation with Jesus, with the God of peace, let it go, give it away. Forgive everyone who ever hurt you every day from now on and receive the resurrection gift of peace. Receive God's gift of peace. Sit in the peace and infinite love of God and you begin to feel less violent and cultivate this as a daily practice. Friends, if you're gonna continue as activists, which you all are doing great things, I'm sure, and you're gonna stand up and speak against the Afghan war or the Trident submarine and there's a cop there or there's a church person yelling at you, and they're going to come at you like this. You've got to be doing your inner work because theoretically it's going to trigger that stuff from your youth, your violence inside of you. And it's going to, you're going to want to lash out at that person, but it has nothing to do with that person. It's what happened when you were five years old. But if you're processing and constantly working on your inner disarmament and practicing it really strong interior nonviolence, my friend, I just gave a retreat last week into a large Buddhist gathering with Roshi Joan Halifax, and she calls this strong back, soft front, as opposed to an American, you know, strong front, but actually pretty weak at the back, you know. Uh, we want to be conscious so that when we do step forward publicly, we won't, we, we won't let that trigger the violence within us, the wound, and we can continue to be consciously, mindfully nonviolent. Secondly, we want to practice meticulous interpersonal nonviolence. How are you doing with that? You know, and you think of the difficult people in your life. And unfortunately, they become your teachers because they're exposing your body. Now, you see what I mean? I think this stuff is really important because we're talking about the world of total war. I mean, if we're not doing this inner work, we have nothing to offer the world. And this is the teaching of all the great peacemakers, and by the way, Jesus. So 